here it is. It's all under the cover, so you can't actually see what's done yet. Ha <laughs> ha. But it is done. And this is the most raw shot. Like, I just went and shot everything with the iPhone very bootleggedly series ever. But I will tell you, what's in this boat build just might be the most important boat build we've ever done on this channel ever. And you'll have to stay around and see why. First things first, I want to give credit to, in my opinion, the best current like economy battery charger out there on the market. I used to have their old one, the Model RS3 from Real Pro, which charged lead acid and AGM batteries perfectly. But this one, the Model RS4, now charges lithium. And here's the thing, no switching required, meaning you don't got to press a switch to program this thing. It already just knows what to do. It senses what the battery is, and it has an algorithm to charge that battery. The consistent charging at six amps allows for all batteries of any type to be charged safely. I installed one in the 1648 and I liked it so much I had to install it in my personal rig right here to the left and I'll tell you what it is the best charger for all my 12 volt batteries. When it comes to a nice worry-free lightweight battery charger that will charge anything by itself without having to be told anything I would tell you to go with the Real 4 Model RS4 charger. Find it at tbnation.net sun is gutting this one. Thank heaven. I'm paying a lot of money. I hate gutting boats. Hate it. Look at this thing. Super old and archaic. Man, this is like the first generation Merc when Mercs were like all the craze back in the day. Remember that? That was a big thing. What kind of boat is this? A Bass Tracker. I've had this boat sitting in my, in my yard for like years now. It's just been kind of miserable. A fan of the channel actually gave this boat to me. <laughs> That's freaking sweet. All right, let's get him in the water, dude. She's ready. <laughs> I haven't really done him any service by just letting it sit here and rot more, so we're gonna work on it. This is actually gonna completely just be a rental boat. I decided I was gonna give this thing away or donate it to science or do something, but I decided after a long, long awaited time that we're just gonna make this thing a rental boat, 100%. Literally any boat we have here, no matter what it is or what it's built like, would be ruined. But here's the whole thing. Only a few of these boats had extensive damage from the foam in them. That was one. It's a John boat. This one does not appear to have any damage to the actual hull. We're looking at it. Generally, you can see signs of corrosion splattering down the bottom of the transom. I don't see any. I don't even see any on the immediate floor. This foam... You can look at it right there. We chewed away at it just to check if it was saturated. No saturation. That foam is clean as can be. This boat, this boat is an old and archaic Bass Tracker Tournament B17, like way from back in the day. I mean, it's a riveted hull. The newer B17s and B18s are like that stamped hull, like this one, which is that's a super nice hull. I can't, I'm so glad we have that. Whole point is, this is fine. Why is it good? Probably because I'm guessing just just based on the way we, we were looking at things right here, that it probably has a middle channel running through the south floor. The south floor does seem to be elevated like much higher than the actual bottom floor. If we're just looking at it and waiting, we have a pretty good like a six inch rise and it's probably got a middle channel. It's probably got other things. We haven't gutted the south floor to its credit, which it appears that we can because this wood is busted. Oh man. And another one, this is a Smokercraft Alaskan hull DB. It's a pre-2000 hull right it's been on the earth for like 30 years maybe 40 it's like it's it's old right at the same pore foam up until about a year ago in the floor for like however long this is i swear it's in it's been 1991 1992 and it's over here 2024 it had the same pore foam in there for years and this is not the best designed hole either i mean the hole is actually really nice design but the gussets on the bottom the drainage it didn't have like new age drainage spines like this might even be 1980s because like that whole little single gusset thing, they, they stopped doing that after a while. They figured out that was not smart. I don't know what year it was, but there was a definite shift. Like that boat. That jumbo doesn't have any of them. That boat has integrated spines all the way down the side, the bottom of the hull that are stamped. Um, but John Boat's predating the year of that one. And that one's the 1990s John Boat. Um, they definitely, they definitely had like riveted keels and then more or less no gussets unless they were underneath the ribs themselves. So this is, so we're talking about a pretty genuinely poor design on the bottom for drainage with poor foam all through the subfloor for 30 years. And you look at the hull, no corrosion. I have not cleaned this hull. And this boat was clapped out when I got it. It was super, it must've been its 10th, 11th, 12th owner, beat, treated like crap, you know, smelt like cat pee. 
Um, this boat was not well taken care of or well maintained by like one or two owners who knew how to store it correctly. So this boat was historically beat up way badly before I got it. And then I did my, my number to it. I abused and used this hole and it's been built and rebuilt like Frankenstein. Well, now it will be going on three times. So what, so what's the deal? Porphyrin would have definitely ruined this boat if poor, because it had every opportunity. It wasn't stored right. It's, it sat in water, sat without a cover out in the, out in the elements. Why didn't it ruin the hull? Huh? The reason is not, it has nothing to do with pore foam. It has to do with design. V holes naturally do better. You can put a middle channel. The subfloor is generally higher. All the water congregates in the middle channel. It doesn't really have a chance to saturate the pore foam and just sit in it and ruin it. Either that or styrofoam sheeting or pink foam board sheeting. Any, any marine foam board sheeting underneath the water, it'll ruin all of it. If it just has a, if it's a pore design, it just has a chance to sit right on it. It'll ruin all of it. So the old and archaic carpet off and part of it's aluminum and part of it is not. Love these wood aluminum hybrid OG builds. They're always fun to, I guess, you know, take apart. I don't exactly know why this piece of board is cut out from the rest of the deck, but I can show you that the foam is in here and it's more or less pulled away with the middle drain channel like I had thought, which is likely why this boat is still looks pretty good and why that foam still looks in pretty good condition. Uh, what the hell, man? A hidden screw somewhere? To my knowledge, I got them all. I thought, man. Yeah, it's really not bad. Unless it's not. Yeah, there's no need to gut that. It's not the most properly laid in, but it's there. It's got not a whole lot of exposure. You could tell when it starts to change colors and it's visibly darker and grittier. And you guys have gutted, anybody who's gutted saturated foam out. This boat doesn't have good water drainage either. You can see right there, there's legit water. There's water all up in that. It's not bad. There's water in this channel. The wood I would have liked to, honestly, if it was in better condition, I would just resin coat and send it on its way. But because it's in such crap condition, like truly it's a monstrosity. And then they put aluminum tape on it. Like if we're being honest. This side looks a little bit more busted. Like it's, well, it's got more leakage, but then it also had a hole in the floor. Like I just don't understand why they did that. But you would have never known that they did that. Oh, great. Now it starts. You would have never known that they did that until you pulled it off to know that it was two pieces of wood seamed together with aluminum tape. So there's one thing we can learn from manufacturer builders and even some of the hack builders out here on YouTube is that you can make something look real pretty if you don't show them how it's built. Ugh. Hmm, old and archaic framing, riveted and corroded. Oh, this is beautiful. This is more than what I wanted to do. Like truly, if the wood was this quality on top, I would have resin coated over it to solidify it and just kept all this old decking on. But since we're gonna have to gut this, well, we might as well just make the boat like more serviceable and better. So <sighs> that's all right, we're too far in. So just for all those people that think a boat needs to be welded in order to make it, just look at how not complete this frame is. Like, see these things? They got a little damage during the demo here of just taking the carpet off, but I'll tell you what, this boat lasted for a very long time. It was written a very long time with just very few rivets and monstrous gaps in the framing. They just carpeted right all over it to hide it. Nobody knew the better. So we'll be doing a few more things here. We'll be taking out some of the old rivets, putting countersink ones in, and uh, we're just kind of ripping the last little bit of the carpet up, sticking it in here. It's gonna be actually a really super easy gut job and restore. We're gonna be done with this thing in a few days. Not a whole lot of hours put into it. It's gonna be good. You know, kind of wish I just left that old carpet in there. Cause it covered up, like the more we remove all this carpet, the more we realize the sheer tomfoolery and the framing, just how basic and stripped down it was just to get it through to make a sail and get it on the water. <sighs> But whatever, we will move past this nonsense. So we got it all kind of cleaned down. Some of the parts we're gonna just get here in a little bit. But you see how this glue, like little pieces of the carpenter here, we grinded more or less all that off on the rest of it. You know, it was frayed everywhere. Little little bits and fragments of the black top. But most of it's cleaned off. We're just gonna salvage this back deck. Yeah, sure, this is all bloated and puffy, but all that foam in there, that is a lot of foam. That has gotta be like 200 ounces of foam, maybe more, and like, same thing over there. Got two nice big foam blocks. Why well, screw that up? So they, they, however they did, they did pretty good. I think put plastic bags 
and had it form fit against whatever compartment was in here. And they had compartments here. And those are kind of, check this out. I thought this was unique. It's a wood topper, three fourth inch wood topper on like a, on a aluminum backing. So we can just replicate this because we bought three fourth inch plier to finish off the deck in the subfloor that we're gonna res coat. So we'll just cut this more closely because we're gonna be gapping it for turf, not carpet. So it'll be way closer gap, resin coat it, and then it can be the new turf hatch. It's kind of a pretty good idea. We're gonna try and salvage more or less whatever we can. We're trying to make this a win. Hey guys, if you made this far into the video, it means you liked something about it at least, like something. So just please hit a like button, possibly comment on what you think is going on here. And if you like these raw videos versus all the flashy stuff, I'd appreciate your feedback on that. All right, I brought this junker into the garage because there's just no way we're gonna be able to do what I thought. The more we uncovered the carpet, the worse it got, and the more bootleggery you saw. Jeez, you're gonna hide a lot with carpet. I had no idea, or at least I had forgot. Oh, I vowed to never touch a tracker again for these reasons, but here we are. So I went ahead and welded the corners of each of these. They were starting to crack and bend. And naturally in these old boats where they had that odd just pieces where they weren't actually joint together, they're just loosely like fastened together on the ends with rivets. Those are always breaking and cracking. So we kind of just took care of that. We'll grind it and sand it and possibly paint this top. And then uh, we'll figure out what we're gonna do for chairs. Over here, now that we have this open up, we can see what this is. So we knew that this is obviously a damage or a repair pad and it's a pretty generous one. That is like three plus feet long. That is a very long patch. And then uh, we can see right here, the pretty extensive damage. But this also worked. Oddly, one piece of metal, a very, very heinous, like something must have just really, really screwed this boat up very, very badly. Just busted through the whole side. I wonder what they hit. I wonder if they ran into like a boat dock or another boat or something. A car hit the boat possibly on a trailer. Like you always got to wonder when, when this happens, like that's just, that's a gem right there. So if it's not broke, don't fix it. We're going to leave it like this. What I am going to fix is the fact that that is now not attached to the hole at all. It's been popped off the rivets and it's been kind of busted out. And so that that's like a major bulkhead of, of the, like of the boat. That's like a major tying wall of the boat right there. And it's not even attached to the hole. So we're gonna just only gonna attach that. So we probably will bend out and re-weld that, no rivets. And then these little, these little puzzle piece things, we're gonna take those out and use them as, si as side supports for the main hatch. We're gonna be honestly upgrading this boat to just one big main hatch. And the only reason I'm doing that is because for one, I have it on hand. And two, the small hatches are just stupid. They're like, you can't really stick anything big like life jackets or float, you know, the emergency life rafts. None of that stuff is really gonna fit, come in and out of those compartments easily. So we're just gonna go ahead and put this one right there. But we are gonna redo the wooden decks and the tops and finish some of that stuff right now. All right, so with this wood, I think it's safe to say that it probably, I think, was marine grade, just because of the sheer lack of voids you see. So this is a standard wood. You'll see a void here every once in a while. You're gonna go with wood, marine grade ply is pretty cool, but it's very expensive and also very hard to find. You, I live in a boating town, I can't even find it. So I think a lot of people are moving on to synthetic boards and marine grade plywood is kind of just like less and less common. But fur rated plywood or standard plywood, like I like to call it, just, that's what this is. It's three quarter inch, the same thickness. When you go, don't get the scrap sheets. Get the most supreme quality plywood sheets you can get, because that's the closest you're actually going to get to marine grade plywood standards, which is what you really kind of want. So when you go and resicote this, you're not resicoting garbage. Because if you have a bunch of nooks and crannies and voids that you can't see from a cheaper plywood piece, it's just going to degrade that much faster and not hold up. I mean, there's those pieces of wood are there for a reason. This one's supposed to keep you up keep you safe and keep you solid on a moving boat in, in conditions, getting towed down the road, getting smacked by waves. I mean, you need the best quality that you're gonna do it if you're gonna do wood at all. Right, so the subfloor and the deck were the easiest pieces to fix. We resin coated the bottom of each. And just in case you're wondering, they're already pre resin -coated. You can see the resin coated lip on the edges. There, that's overflowing from underneath. Then we waited specifically for the top because we have to install things like screws and everything else, including this hatch that we're going to do right here. I could have just used the other hatches and repurposed them like I did for the back deck, but I wanted a supreme quality hatch that was going to be strong and long lasting since I'm going to actually be 
also installing a pedestal mount here. So there's gonna be a dual purpose hatch. It's gonna give me large, spacious access to anything I need in that front compartment and also be a spot for a butt seat or a regular seat with a pedestal. And after I originally did this wood aluminum hybrid conversion on a 14 footer, a lot of people asked me, do you have to actually flush mount this hatch because I went in there with a the router to make it flush? No, you do not. In fact, I'm going to show you how simple it is to not even do that. That's a way overcomplicating the process, way more time in. And in the end, when you put the HydroTurf camo over, you can't even tell either way. It does help, though, that it's installed before you start resin coating. We also secured that hatch and the entire deck down to the frame with stainless self-tappers. We have secured wood to aluminum with one-inch rivets before, and that's also an option. So resin coating is kind of a messy affair in that the initial penetration layer is kind of rough in the finish. Right now I'm going over it with a propane torch because that will actually pop a lot of the air bubbles rising as the resin penetrates and you can kind of see that. A lot of them will not go away, but that's actually just the wood bloating in spots. And there's nothing you can do about that. You have to sand over it once the resin cures. It's kind of a waiting game. You gotta wait 24 hours minimum just to kind of sand it. Uh, 48 hours really if you want a full cure before you add the second layer if you're going to re-carpet this It doesn't really matter what the texture of the surface is It's because we're going to put EVA foam over this or do this entire conversion for EVA foam Since it's so much better than carpet or vinyl or anything out there and that requires the slickest smoothest glassy surface possible Which is why we're doing this process on the bottom. I don't really think there's a need for a giant deep penetration really It gets the bottom like gravity goes downwards so it's always gonna be on the top. And for that, we use a slow cure. I think that's 205 fast. And we use a 206 slow from West Systems. Uh, West Systems uh, 105 epoxy, which is marine epoxy. And it's just heavily recommended whenever you're glassing or like sealing wood. You can even see dead spots where no matter how much resin we put there, it, the wood kept soaking it in. So we're gonna have to wait for that to like dry. We did put a lot on there. We put quite a bit on, on this section. And then we put quite a bit on this section and then just over here, we're gonna have to do the same thing. There's gonna be spots that are there and spots that are not great. We'll just assess it. Cause really the glossier it is, the better it is to stick. Possibly if, after the slow harder cures in the morning, if it's still not good, we'll hit it with fast hardener to just to gloss it over. We'll hit it with the sander, orbital sander real quickly to find it down. Then we'll get the remaining part with fast hardener. When we're doing all that, we'll be getting the rest of this stuff prepped. Now I've got two, three, three quarter inch sheet of plywood or just shy of three quarter inch. Um, the bottom was actually half inch, believe it or not, but three quarter inch is going to do a lot better for the long term of stress put on it. It's just going to make the whole thing stronger. Uh, there was one thing though, the piece in here was legitimately wider than four feet. And I did not have an answer for that other than just to extend this with an aluminum piece, like aluminum sheeting all the way back into the, to the, to the hole when we get to that point, but we got to wait for this clear first and then we'll just finish that stuff floor off right there. And we'll just use these areas as a way to trace where we need to uh, screw in there and we should have actually done that before I resin coated over this I didn't do that and that was fail It'll be all right though. Look at this stupid fly I walk right on my resin floor It is mind your own business to stay off my new resin coated bow plate, but you had to just interfere and now you're stuck how terrible <laughs> Hey guys, you can do a lot of this project with just stuff from the hardware store, but once we start getting to the nitty gritty, all the boat parts and the turf, we get it right here, tbnation.net, and all the parts are listed. Remember those old wooden hatches that were carpeted but had that aluminum backing? Well, we prepped these 3 4 inch pieces to fit right back there. The original pieces were only half inch thick with carpet, which made it 3 quarter inch thick. So now we actually had to use a true 3 quarter inch thick piece that matched the height of the deck here with a perfect gap for turf. And we're gonna paint those edges black so it looks stock. And then get an overspray off the top because the turf doesn't like stick to overspray. What I mean by gap for turf is that the gap between the hatch and the frame needs to be closer for it to look right. Otherwise, there's this monstrous one inch gap around the whole hatch, which they need it for carpet, but you do not need it for hydro turf or any EVA foam backing. How we used to do these hatches is we used to get one piece of wood and then we would put a lip either it's equivalent size or a little bit short depending on the thickness you would go half inch and then three eighths or quarter inch to like get obviously three quarter thickness or in this case we're doing three quarter and half inch to get inch and a quarter thickness or you, this is kusa board this is synthetic board it's just synthetic board 
It's really, I haven't used it in a very long time because there has been no use. It's really good for salt water applications where you're fiberglassing, but not really so much for marine applications where you're just using a lot of aluminum or wood actually just tends to be the better, cheaper, more effective product. But in this case, I think Kusa board lips, if I didn't have this, I would be using half inch uh, plywood, just like this plywood, and that would be fine. We resin coat it, saturate it. But what this is better, although it's not as strong per spand as what is, it is lighter and it is much more flexible. It doesn't creak, crack. It won't, it won't split like this over time. This is what wood does over time. It splits, comes apart. And that's why resin coating wood is its best chance of surviving because it stops it, it thwarts it from splitting and doing its natural organic process. But this stuff, you don't have to actually worry about it. It's not organic. And uh, once we put this in here and cut it, we will then resin coat the entire outside layer in quick set, uh, fast cure, uh, marine epoxy, and then we'll flip it over. You know, the side that really, really matters that's going to get the most abuse will be putting slow cure. I'm just only using, I'm only using Kusa board because I have it. I would not go and source this just for this product. I would go and get plywood and keep it nice and cheap and simple and effective. All right, sped up in time. These two pieces are cured. I had to do some hatches wooden. There were just odd pieces that like to make a fabricated aluminum hatch to do it, I could have done it, but it would have just not been part of the whole budget process. And the truth is though, these hatches may not last a whole 30 years like if they were aluminum, they will last a very long time. And so this bigger hatch is the actual back hatch covering the gas tank right on the transom. That's why it's cut off at the very edge because it's, it's a rear facing hatch and you need that last little bit. I'll show you why in a little bit. But this one, I use fast cure underneath, but that's the live wall hatch and I need a deep penetration because water will be contacting the bottom a lot. So that one is slow cured all the way around and around there you can see where the resin really kind of soaked in the edges. We're going to go ahead and hit that again with like fast cure to make sure the edges are solid. This is where you kind of really need a thickened epoxy. If you can find thickened epoxy, it works way better for the edges once the initial slow cure has sunk it into the grain. All right guys, these hatches in record time because I let them sit out in the sun. I let the, I let the like resin do its thing and penetrate for about an hour and then after that it's going to get inside the wood as much as it's going to get right any spots that went dead or flat i re-went over them with resin until there was a gloss finish and some of them even to this man right down to the very end still some still some minor flat spots which is going to be fine the majority of it is nice and polished and ready there is some grit from some of the bubble like rippling up on the wood we'll just have to briefly sand over that this is pretty solid filling i don't foresee anything really getting it. It's pretty much, we made like a plastic log. That's what you do when you, re when you resin coat a piece of wood. It's like, just, I get a really strong protective layer of plastic lining the whole thing. And that's what makes it awesome. Let's go see where these fit. Ooh, that fits real good. Okay, so for this part, I was going to just I was actually going to cut this and move it down and try and get it flush with this because this can only go so high because of this. And then I just was like, no, this is already nonsense enough. I'm already going to have to weld this gap so this doesn't sink in. It hasn't done it for 30 years, but it's still like if I, if I can weld this. But here's this is, ends raised here. And because of that, this won't sit flush. When I went to do to test fit, this didn't sit flush. And that's why it's only sided on three. On the very back side, we're gonna just figure out exact depth of aluminum or something or buffer that we need to put right there. And we'll just put it right on that elevated lip, but the way it's set right here, um, it should be a problem. Yeah, it's just flush. It's either a quarter inch or a three eighth inch gap that we can fill it with a piece of flat bar or multiple pieces of flat bar. We'll go ahead and sand this down and prep it and paint the edges and get it ready. And then we're going to go ahead and prep the rest of this and get this ready for turf. I mean, we're, we're right at that age, that stage where we need to do it. Need to run a few conduits, though. I mean, the back conduit here is whatever it is. I don't know where the throttle shift control is either. It's kind of bad. Time for this legendary vintage, whatever this is, Merc 80 to come off. All right, this thing was a lot heavier than I thought. It looks small. It's not. It's heavy. You need two people, but I tried. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and fast forward just through the whole motor process. We're putting a 60 horse. It's not the newest, but it's not the oldest. It's fairly good condition, low hours, brand new lower, and I think it'll do well. This boat is a fairly big boat. I think a 60 is probably perfect. Push it between 25 and 30 at a very good speed, cruising down the lake, but not so fast that it'll be a danger. Obviously, we're a little far ahead of there, so let's go back and see how we did the hatches. There is one aluminum hatch I did, and it was from our like build from scratch systems. 
Only instead of using the corner brackets, I could weld, so I just welded it. Right here, this is just uh, three quarter inch tubing. And we just have welded it in spots. We gotta grind a few of these high spots off and kind of droop down in there. But whole thing is this is supposed to sit flush there. And then we're going to just rivet sheet metal. You think somehow it's got, okay, this like this. Yeah, we had it so it edged up and we can join the pieces here on this three fourths, which is sketch by itself, but it's the only way. That's all, that's all, we're trying to kind of do this out of scrap aluminum that I have. This will be the most foolproof hatch I got, but not the only one. All right. It is a million times nicer than it was. It's two quarter inch tubing. This looks through top. Cross beams where you see these lines. Rivet it to the top. Obviously the frame down there was welded. Did try to weld this here. It was an epic fail. So we ended up riveting it and smoothing it out. But the whole thing is that can be turfed and it'll be pretty nice. Not bad. Pretty spacious. And the hole is already down in there. So, I mean, pretty, you can stick pretty much anything you need in there. It's pretty generous. So I've had to make my own hinge here, which I will kind of grind and polish down. So what we just made, what we did is made an inch and a quarter by inch and a half out thick hinge that will actually sit in this very odd size that we have. So I had to make up my hinges back in the day. This is super bringing back a lot of nostalgic moments, but I riveted through the back. You know, a million rivets to the back. Then I had to come back and trim off the head back here or shave them down to where it didn't really compromise the strength of the rivet. And then drill holes in the back of this so this would sit flush against this, the back. So it, it can be done with just rivets if you got to make your own custom hinges. It just takes a lot longer. I did this in five minutes literally and that's ready to go you can get most basic things done with rivets just not fast so that'll go right there this will go right on there Ooh, look how good it fits all right drill the holes i countersink them with a countersinking deburring bit and get those a harbor freight for like next to nothing and now this is actually we're ready to kind of install this on the hatch here's our wood hatch which i could have sanded down and made a little bit more polished but really see underneath of this thing and nobody for speed purposes okay so this hinge is going to go like this right on here and with a little luck we missed all the screw spots we did all right they're in there they are in the metal you see what i did there the metal look never mind here anyways what you should see is this there are screw heads here which I did pre-drill to avoid this nonsense. It still happened at least one anyways, but the other ones, it kind of got pretty clean. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grind these ends off flush, right? Which will which will keep it good, consistent with the turf. But I mean, that's pretty much all the way through the wood. That's an inch and a quarter thick of wood. Those screws ain't gonna rip out from pressure from the hinge. So that's, that's a bigger thing. Otherwise I have to use like bolts and T-nuts, but there's enough of these that I think it will have a, a good long, long lasting thing with the whole deal. So I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm just gonna just go ahead and grind these off. And then once we get that in, then we'll start to put the struts in and we'll be putting one on each end because this is a heavy hatch. All right, so this thing has these funky little angle brackets. I'm pretty sure those are, they might be aluminum. They don't look like they're any rust. Well, I don't know. That's the only thing bonding the transom to the hole and the hole even of itself is very questionable. Uh, we will be taking these off and adding our extra thick piece of aluminum here to reinforce the transom since we're not removing the transom. If we did want to remove the transom, we could because this is a capped transom with removable caps here that are just held in by screws. So we could take it out and that's still an option. But really that's gonna complicate things tremendously. You'll have to end up taking this piece out, which is very hard. Well, it's, it just complicates things. There's a bunch of things that happen with the transom and when you do it, like stuff is never the same. But because we're well on our way to salvaging most of the boat for what it was, we're gonna salvage this transom by just reinforcing it on each side. I don't know, once you once you got rid of all the carpet and stuff, you really just see a lot of horrifying things. And here's the finished product. Yep. There it is. Can you do it with wood? Yes. Just, just a lot more work and time. But sometimes, just because of how odd this would have been to try and get anything aluminum done it would have had to been custom fitted measured then who knows if it was right it's just the extra gap down here the extra thick 
beam and all these things. It just doesn't happen on aluminum lids unless you custom make them like our build from scratch ones. Just we needed that extra lip. We needed that extra hangover. We needed all that to make it kind of work to the stock junk framing of this boat. And yeah, I can't even, I don't even think I have an under support that I, I could just brace underneath it and I'll think about it. But all it would take is just like six more screws. But I think we're not even gonna need that, guys. It's, it's a very robust piece here. I wonder how long this will last. It's a good test, because it's about as good as it gets. On these hatches, sometimes if you do them this way, um, you'll have high spots and low spots, either from resin kind of clumping or dripping over, or just from the wood itself, like bloating from the resin saturation. You're gonna have to go in there and sand the high spots down. I would do it with like, I mean, you can go however low or high, but I, I did this with 80 grit, which is pretty aggressive to get just the high spots that went over it very, very briefly. Then you want to go maybe down to 220 grit. And then this is as low as 400 grit. I mean, the lower you go, I mean, in steps, the better the, the finish is going to come out. The smoother it is, the better the turf is going to stick. But it should stick after 400. Definitely want a, a smooth, pliable surface that is already prepped with alcohol and free contaminants, you know, cleaned and prepped and ready for the turf to lay down once you're at that final step. And we just now did this back hatch here. And it is more or less um, after after prep fairly flat. You want it flat with very low divots and very low spots that'll hold air and prevent adhesion promotion. So. Another big problem was how do you get all that old glue off the actual aluminum deck that's left there? And so we found the best way to do it was with 220 grit, sandpaper, 80 grit. Didn't work. 400 grit didn't work. Like 220 grit for whatever reason just took that glue right off so the minute i had a chance i just went and went all over it there's a good chance that the turf would have just stuck right to the glue had i just smoothed it out and that was my initial plan but since the 220 grit started getting it off so well i was like well, why don't we just take it off and we'll have the best adhesion from the turf to the deck that we can all right so the glue try and strip it off with chemicals you're going to screw a bunch of things up it's going to leak into places it's going to stay there and smell so, I mean, this is old and archaic glue, right? It's all dried out. We know it. So the you can actually sand this. It's not, when the glue is still really good and elastic, you can't sand it because it's flexible and it causes a bunch of problems. Then you got to use chemicals and it's horrible. Um, but this stuff has just been dry rotted. We, we saw the quality of the carpet, how it just ripped off like nothing. So this stuff can be sanded right off. It just sands the dust. Dig over with 80 grit to get some rough spots off, but 80 grit won't effectively really get this out. The 400 grit over there, um, that smooths it out. You really want to hit it with 400 grit or finer as your finished product because you want this aluminum to be smooth as possible. Not all gritty. Even 220 grit is like, even that's not, that's kind of a really good middle ground between harshness and fineness. Um, it's still too coarse. Of, of a texture in here. You're really gonna wanna smooth that over with 400 or better. And the smoother the surface, the better it will be. Like technically, we don't have to take any of this glue off. We could just have to hone over it with 400 once we get all the high spots off with 80. And uh, as long as it's smooth and decontaminated, it would be just fine. But since uh, we found that 220 is actually taking the glue off much better than 80, um, we're gonna go ahead and get as much of it off as we can. We might as well. And then we'll have the cleanest, most pliable surface for the adhesion. All right, we got the wood decks turfed. There it is, painted, turfed, cut over. Then all we have are these ugly sidewalls, which we'll probably turf too, if we're being honest. But we could just paint these too, very carefully, since we've um, kind of gotten ahead of ourselves. But I really, I really kind of needed this deck on, at least the front deck on, because trying to run the trolley motor, trying to run some of the other stuff. It just needs to be finished. So we have a nice finished front. All that wood came out pretty nice. We've got that little section there. Um, this was just one sheet minus about eight or 10 inches cut off here and then cut off to the sides. But then we then took the sides cut off that we cut up from here because you know this table. And that's what it looks like right here. When we took that random triangular piece and used it to finish off this section here. See this off this little bit here? We'll end up taking that other piece and it's gonna finish that section right there. We got that that black wooden edge, the resin coated wooden edge, which looks pretty clean. There it is. All right, so time to paint the interior. I chose this super flat brown. It's like Rust-Oleum camo. 
it is the flattest brown you'll ever see. Almost to the point where it's dry looking. Could I have used a more aesthetic paint? Sure, but I think gloss black would look phenomenal on these side walls. And gloss black on the outside would make this brown cam pop because of the black inside of it. Would just It would just look really good. The whole thing is though, the better looking I make this, the harder it will be to maintain that look. Because remember, this is gonna be a rental boat and that changes the dynamics. Because if I was making a boat for somebody and this was gonna be their personal boat, I would try to make it look as best I could because they would take care of it. But the minute I give this to a rental, you know what mentality people have for rentals. You gotta be able to put this boat out there with somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're doing and just be able to look away from it. And that's the reason I didn't turn that other 1648 that I did into a rental boat because it came out so nice. Everybody's like, it's gonna get immediately ruined. Why, why put it in there? So keeping that in mind, we're trying to keep costs extremely low for this boat, but also pick colors and schemes that when stuff happens to them, it doesn't really matter. The turf already looks like somebody pulled it out of a porta potty. The brown on the side is ultra flat and just going to be overall hard to mess up. And if they do mess it up, it's so flat that putting brand new flat paint on it is just going to make it look like it was just, you can't even tell. That's a good benefit of having flat paint on top of flat paint is you can repaint it and repaint it and repaint it forever as you know, if it gets scratched and nobody can tell. But if you do that to gloss, you can absolutely tell. I gotta do all kinds of prep work and all kinds of things, but I wanna be able to rattle can the inside of the interior if somebody screws it up real bad, very quickly, five minute prep. On the outside, same thing, only we'll probably use gloss paint because gloss paint does much better in the water. All right, you know that doesn't look too bad. Looks all right. I mean, I had to, this is the wire conduit. I'm not tracing it through the, the crap way that they had it before. It was stupid. This way is still not much better, but it's way simpler. So it's a piece of inch and a quarter tubing. Spot welded. I had to do this all. That was a real pain. And then this, because the, the floor was thicker, like I had to, the actual panel got pushed up. And so it was uneven with the deck. So I had to make it sloop down. That was kind of stupid. I just got all these pieces of aluminum here just so to stop over spray. But we got this poop, this like camo flat earth brown. It's basic flat camo paint. I can spot spray anytime there's something wrong just to touch it up. So I wanted something that's super easy to maintenance and this is about as easy as it gets. Way back in the day, we're like scoops, kind of like towel. I think it's a cow or a forced air induction, you know, like just, a, it's an induction to blow like, because it's a complete sealed end. When it's all said and done, it's, you need gas fumes. So way down in here, we got this uh thingy here and that was attached to that i gotta figure out a fancy way to attach that back here so it stays you see these ended up just gonna looping wire underneath because i just didn't know how how better to do it um that's gonna slightly we're gonna be able to get away a lot because we're using turf we'll be able to cut this out this little divot here we'll be able to do quite quite a bit more because of how versatile the, the hydro turf is and that means we'll, we'll be able to just screw these here but that's how we got this attached otherwise we were gonna i don't even know where this other one is i think we threw it away so these i really just did not see for a lot of reasons i don't want to use this so we'll be going and putting it here we'll also have to there was like screws like just the worst bad angle self-tapping screws holding this all in so we'll be going ahead and re-riveting and re recocking this because this was sealed at one point in time so water didn't just leak back in here if it did it wouldn't really terribly matter because it all goes right down to the to the floor but that's how we're going to attach it and stuff like this see this it's like they just had a bag of fasteners and used it whatever they could like the thing is put together with a bubble gum and shoestring the thing was put together with milk buddy we're gonna do the same thing here we got little pieces here we did that with a uh, bailing wire that we just bent and we'll underhook it and then put it through these holes that we that we drilled here tape it out like we did right there then we'll have air grabbing it this way and pushing it out that way what probably won't be as good as obviously if we had a full cow like that but this cow is super invasive on the deck we know that to be true now hey folks we're not just on youtube we are all over pretty much all major social media platforms tiktok instagram and facebook and they all have their unique advantages to what they offer the general public all right guys it's ready we go ahead and turf it. We epoxied and we sanded and we leveled all the panels out there smooth and ready to be for turf. Same thing with all the aluminum where we got most of that nasty decaying rotting glue off um, with 220 grit. Then we hit it over with 400 grit 
all of it's polished with 400 grit, which gives it a nice permeable surface for the turf to stick on. We just wiped it down with alcohol. We are now ready to go ahead and turf this back deck. Like there's this and it's overlaying this, which is overlaying this. And then there's that little divot from the bloating of the foam. Plus that, and plus these are wood hatches. I'm gonna give you just a really good testimony of how versatile HydroTurf is, the camo, and hiding all of this nonsense. Cause this is a really horror deck. The carpet didn't even do a good job hiding it. Supreme faith in HydroTurf to hide all this. All right, as we cut our safety strip here, we're gonna go ahead and lay that right in the middle. We're gonna just kind of center it. Once we lay the safety strip, we're gonna turn around and pull the piece back, lay it over this. So when you're installing this, there is better and worse practices to install it, but there is no wrong way to install it. As long as you prep the surface with denatured alcohol and you are doing it in a cool area out of the sun and the aluminum is room temperature to touch, you can move this turf all around as long as you don't press permanently on it. Like right now, I can just eye this and straight. A lot of people have to run lines and do templates and like they got all these measurements I gotta do, I can just eye it. Nine times out of 10, it's right. And for the one time it's not, I can actually go back and pull it after taking the rest of the backing off and just fluff it straight. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. I noticed you guys saw like the front deck already turfed. I actually did that on a live feed. And so I was doing some things that I can get away with, but I was telling the general public, don't do what I do, don't do it this way. Because I found that in large, my way of doing things clashes with most other craftsmen's way of doing things. Like they like to measure, they like to be precise, they like all this other like nonsense. And maybe they were prepped through the institution of tradesmen for that to be best practice, or maybe it's just best practice for them. But what I will tell you, and I wanna clear up, there was no real wrong way to install this. Because I installed this in what even a lot of my crew think is the wrong way but their outcomes for their turf installs are not any better than mine. My crew was just down here. They actually turfed a boat um, in a live also. I think their methods were obviously more traditional and it probably appealed to a wider audience, which is super beneficial. But in the end, the outcome of how they put that turf on, the outcome wasn't any more or less impressive than mine. Nothing that I saw that wowed me and said, wow, maybe I should do it that way. And that is because it's just preference on how this is installed. Where very gross meticulous installation starts to matter is on the teak line turf or the designed turf. That stuff, if the deck is not completely flush underneath or you don't have exact measurements, then it does get real screwed up. But this is not that. This is camo hydro turf, which is potentially the most adaptive thing that has ever been out to hit the market. Its ability to seam together as long as you cut straight down one side of the groove and match it is unbeatable. There's nothing else out there like it. It's extremely durable and robust, but if you somehow manage to damage it, you can just cut out a whole strip just however big or small it is and put in a brand new strip as long as it's cut down the groove and you can't even tell because of the camo design so effectively breaking up anything i could cut this into a million puzzle pieces and stick it on this deck and then trim it out trim out the hatches and unless you really really look for those seams and cuts you would never be able to tell i guess my whole point to this rant is that if you're scared to install this stuff don't be Okay, it's easier to install than carpet. And I know you hear a lot of these people talk and all oh, you gotta have this skill and you don't actually have to have any skill, right? You just have to have your own standard on how you want it. And then you can recorrect and recorrect and recorrect until you get it right. That's the beauty of this thing. Do not get caught up in some sort of right or wrong way. Cause I'm here to tell you there's not. The only thing you have to remember is that do not press down with your hand or apply pressure to the adhesive because that activates the adhesive. So do not do that unless that is exactly where you want to place it and you are absolutely sure. And there's also a lot of these craftsmen and tradesmen out there. There have been many since this channel has started who have like rigorously been extremely critical of this channel and what it produces. And they've tried to force their interjection. And if you take a look at them and what they do and what they've prospered or proceeded to do, it just comes down to jealousy for them. Like, I can't relate to them. I didn't grow up in the trades. I was, uh, I had the most miserable beta male office job before I even like learned that this was actually my true calling where I was in my element just to create and make things. Then when I shifted to it, I just naturally, not even really trying, took it all over in this venue. And there were people before me, lots of them. And as time goes on, they get bigger and hungrier and more ruthless, but they all end up failing. For they don't actually understand why this channel succeeds. They end up insulting the audience of this channel, trying to take the members away from it. All their strategies reek of gross implementation and theory failure because they don't actually understand what's going on. If the theory is wrong, then their approach and implementation will always be wrong. And so I don't actually have to do anything 
but just let them be themselves. A lot of them have flamed us just to attach themselves to our branding, thinking that somehow our branding will give clout to them. Like all they have to do is be seen and then that's all it's gonna be. And then we're the barrier between them being seen and not being seen. But these same people have sold their soul to other influencers 20 times bigger than we are to promote their boat builds. And like they've done it with multiple influencers, all of which have generated millions of actual views, yet their, their actual growth is either stagnant or fleeting. So my message to all these tradesmen who think they're about something here on YouTube that blame us for them not succeeding, let me tell you something, it's definitely not us. We're not the barrier to your lack of success. And if you somehow possess the intellect to figure it out one day, then you'll realize very quickly that like coming at us was maybe the stupidest thing, most biggest waste of time you could have ever done, which is super unfortunate for them because time is finite. You can never get more of it back. You can waste money, you can blow money all the time. They make more and more of it every day. But the one thing you can never waste is time. So you must be crucial and critical and make sure that your time is actually valid and going towards specific strategies to make you successful. So unless your strategy is to become a reaction channel to this channel, I guess that would be a way to get clout and fame, but it would not be acknowledged for your actual trade skills, but rather just your ability to be entertaining through reactions. In the end, to avoid the sheep life entirely, you only need to learn two skills, how to sell, and financial literacy, then you can beat anything. I think the biggest problem with people who find us as opponents is they don't understand the dynamics of how to sell. Selling is all about solving problems. What problems are you solving for people? If your channel is not promoting any problem solving tips and tricks or tactics, or you yourself are incapable of actually promoting a sale just due to what your personality or your ethics or your manner of video, whatever it may be, then therein would lie where your theory failure is. But in order to actually get over said theory failure, you would have to be honest with yourself. But given all the lies that continue to be spread by you, I'm assuming that honesty is probably not your best trait, even self-honesty. At this point, we can say, due to some of the comments from the audience, that there has been marked impairment on our branding because of said lies, and we could just easily sue you and get rid of you very quickly that way. But we follow the principle of the eagle. For the only thing that can attack an eagle is a crow. But when the crow attacks, the eagle doesn't waste its time to turn around and fight it in midair. It just simply flies higher and higher and higher, and the crow cannot keep up with the altitude the eagle can fly at. If you want to become true contenders with us, learn how to become an eagle. Otherwise, all you'll ever be is a crow. So after much deliberation and thinking, uh, we finally got the trolling motor mount. Decided to go with the Minn Kota Power Drive. I think it's, I mean, it's one I have lying around. It's only 45 pounds, but I really don't want anything more expensive. I keep thinking this boat's probably gonna go to a lot of older individuals who don't necessarily know what they're doing. And I just, I don't need a very torquey trolling motor to just go left or right and throw them off the boat and then have it in the newspaper that they got ran over by their own boat. And I just don't, I think 45 pound is enough to keep them in most moderate winds and get them a good pace of two to three miles an hour with the whole boat. They're not so strong enough to yank them off. Even really a 55 would probably be much more ideal for a boat this big, but I mean, there's a lot of boats this big that have 45 pounders. And honestly, I had the 45 pound Minn Kota Edge on that 16 footer and that thing flew at like four and a half miles an hour with a 45 pounder. It was, we, were, we were flying, two people. I think V-holes are naturally just a little bit more sluggish, sluggish in the water. This is not a very deep V, but it definitely is still a V. All right, trolling motor kits. So we give you these plus a bunch of connectors and wiring. This is six gauge. This always comes with 10 gauge. You're gonna always gonna have to double it up and splice it over. In this case, we extended it, but we're gonna be cutting these leads off, cutting it back to here. You're gonna cut up an extra long piece of this, of the, you know, the rubber coating, and you're gonna be able to double it up. So 10 on top of each other equals about eight, which will fit to a six gauge uh, crimper. And so that's how we're gonna get around that. We'll probably just cut a hole right here, right at the barrier base and shove the wire through here. We put an access port here because I realized it was trying to do it all through that access port is just stupid. I'll we'll probably just cover that thing up. I cut it out and now I really wish I didn't cut it out because now I've got to panel it. There's a Hobie hatch. You guys know that? A friend of mine gave me this. Uh, a friend's gonna help me go into this rental business gave me this so I figured he probably would like this hatch. You can move your hand around and maintenance whatever is inside the front because you need to know what's happening inside the front of the boat just like you need to know what's happening inside the back. So nice little plastic hatch here. Another big problem is the paint job on this boat is currently too clapped out for even a rental boat to be appealing. So we had to do something. So I'm thinking a uh, smoke gray, old traditional Rust-Oleum rattle can job, 
that gloss is a little bit more marine resistant versus like a matte or satin or flat paint on it. And it already had paint on it, but like given my experiences and trying to remove paint from older boats, like the paint made back in the old days was actually legitimate hard like strong paint and somewhere down the line it got watered down with chemicals and regulations from osha so the paint like on the boats now a lot easier to take off but the old paint i don't know what's in it it's just better to rough it up and use it as its primer it's the best primer it'll never come off the aluminum so just i just reprimered over that after roughing it up with self-edging primer for any areas that actually went straight to the bare aluminum that way we have a nice primered finish and then obviously rustoleum on rustoleum we're using their traditional like smoke gray gloss paint so normally i would roll and tip this with smoke gray oil-based enamel but this gloss i swear is the exact same paint just in a, a rattle can form All right so you have to spray more of it it's not going to go on as thick but it will give you the same relative finish with like two or three coats will black look better on this absolutely but i told you we're on a budget for this boat and that's what i had in my paint locker and it looks all right. We'll stick some decals on it saying rent me and then our phone number and, you know, website. And it'll be cool like that. Only thing that's left really now is just to turf the subfloor and cockpit and then put the console in. Before doing that, I wanted to run the wires from the back and the front. Make sure everything's rigged. That way, when we go to tie the console in there, finally, we can just run all the wires right directly to it. We're going to be running the battery for the trolling motor up here in the front because there's no good place to put it anywhere else and the house and starter battery will probably be in the back. As far as how much HydroTurf covers what? Well, one piece covered that front deck, uh, one piece covered the back deck, and then pretty much I made one piece, I cut it and manipulated it. Not the cleanest way to do it, but if you're trying to be conservative, which is what I'm trying to do here, then one piece will do this gigantic cockpit. For the console, we're going to be using a RPD. 1422 side console. This is one of two side consoles they make for aluminum boats like this. This is the most conservative, cost-effective one. And I'll tell you, as somebody who welded a side console for the other 1648, sure, it was better than this one, but not so much better that it was even worth it to go through all that trouble to weld one up. Truth be told, this thing is the most cost-to-effective console you can buy. They have several different colors, different add-ons. They're very easily modifiable. They come with a triangle bevel for the throttle shift control if you need to even use that. They have an extremely thick HDPE plate backing that front so like nothing can flex and break or crack over time. It's very seriously durable. It caused me a little bit of problems with how we installed these switches but it got around it just had to make them thicker and wider in the inside. So I bought this switch panel, his little four gang like waterproof rocker switch from amazon it was like 17 bucks or something it was dirt cheap for four switches really we're only going to be running three only like three prongs so it's super easy to not mess up like that one that's doubled up in wires that's because i doubled up the front and rear nav light so this one will control the nav lights then there's a power lead from the fuse block to the switch which then goes out to both nav lights and then there's a ground on the very top it is very distinguishable in the instructions for it other electronic items i had to unfortunately buy were a fish finder and a battery charger that would be the easiest way and obviously give the angler the tools needed to at least pace and figure out the lake it works we're on the boat the boat itself is a success it drives and feels really well we just had four people in it like we definitely overloaded the boat on purpose the prop is way too low pitch and we put the steering cable in backwards so it steers the wrong way, but we, we still drove it knowing that it steered the wrong way, but, and then the throttle, this is an older throttle shift. It's not necessarily kosher. And then we did come in this, this gnarly storm came out of nowhere. It's about to wreck us. So we're just gonna, we're just not gonna, we're probably gonna leave, <laughs> but it's, I would say overall, this is a pretty good success, guys. It's, it's, it feels pretty comfortable to drive. It's not too bad. We broke the tail light. <laughs> Keep going. All right. See that, man, guys? It's pretty serious. So now that we got all the fails fixed and we put on a different prop, they're going to go and try it again. These two, Anthony and Nate. Great. I suspect that with the abnormally high standards these guys seem to have in the live feed we did the day earlier, that they'll probably be very critical of this build, which is good. 
They already found fail one. Then I forgot to seal up a hole from the initial motor before I put on the jack plate. So it's just leaking water into the transom. <laughs> they haven't even got a bilge pump. I got you guys, I got you guys. Oh, look at stairs. It's amazing. Look yeah. Right. Hundred percent. Fail number two. I hung the transducer too low, so it's shooting out like a rooster tail. But that's easily fixable with just some screw adjustments. And other than saying that the trolling motor was a little underpowered, and you know, it's just a power drive, so it's not the best that the boat itself handled fantastic, got them at a really good cruising speed, and they had way more range than we did, so they left us. Like, I got a six gallon, they had a whole 12 gallons of gas back there. So they went and did their thing and had some fun together, and then they just came back later and told me what their experience was. Needless to say, I wouldn't have patched that hole back there. Um, that was a fail, got ahead of myself. I did rush this. I got it done in about a week and a half. That's the fastest I've ever built a boat, like ever. And so, uh, yeah, when you rush, I don't know, quality control is not what it would be if you didn't rush. So I'm just happy that it was this little bit of fails and they were all very fixable. And uh, at the end, I had a really nice solid boat here. So my son and his friends, all of which are well over the age to be publicly here on YouTube, came out here to fish with me. So we'll get a good idea because these boys, they generally just backpack it. Yeah, remember back in the days we used to shore bang and backpack when you were young? Man, these boys are grinding. There's the bikes back there on the truck right there. It's real hard. It's real tough to fish this lake without a boat. That's a very nice fish. Good job, bud. How about here? Get him. I'm pulling your leg, huh? Oh my gosh, dude. It's PB striker right there. That's a PB? Sweet. Oh, I guess. Hey, you're gonna get the hook on. No, oh, it'll be all right. Who can get him out? Four. No, three. He's a th he's he's definitely a, big enough to be a three. We call that a three for sure. Nice one, brother. Thank you, guys. There he is. Running for his life, man. For sure. So my final analysis, the prop pitch might be one pitch too high. It needs to go one pitch lower and it'll probably perform way better. And the trolley motor is a little underpowered, but it still does the job. Overall, the four of us went out and caught quite a few fish, but the bigger testimony is that we restored this entire boat for peanuts. I mean, aside from the motor and some of the accessories, there was not a whole lot of cost that went into this boat at all. I think maybe 12, 1500, could have been a straight grand if I didn't like add the front lid and a few other accessories, but I really thought those were pertinent for the boats, but it's up to you. But it does prove to Stan that building a boat like this for about a grand is definitely doable. I hope this helped you out there, guys. Tight lines. Good luck.